Um, why would you pick a hobby that is loaded up with stuff that you hate? It makes no sense. So don't do that. Don't do that. As a coach, one of the questions I get asked the most often is how do I know if I'm stage ready or how do I know when I'm going to be stage ready? So it's a complex question with a lot of different layers to the answer. And we're going to dive into those today. Among other things, this is episode 252 of the drop set. Let's hit it. What's up, everybody? Darren Starr here, full-time coach, coming at you with episode 252 of The Drop Set. If you are watching on YouTube, hi, everybody. This is a podcast. This is a long-form video, minimal editing, nothing too fancy going on here. Just some good discussion about topics that I think are relevant, questions that get asked me all the time. Different from the other YouTube stuff on this channel. If you're listening to the audio-only version on any podcast platform that you can find this on, Welcome. We are now on Amazon Podcasts as well. It only took eight years. Good Lord. But it happened. Um, and all it took was an email and filling out a form. I didn't even know I wasn't on Amazon Podcasts, honestly. But uh, I figured it out. So there we go. News of the week. Here we go. This is exciting. This was a big step. I did not take this step lightly. I am now on Instagram as at the Drop Set Podcast. So... For any social media related to this show, at the Drop Set Podcast on Instagram is the place to go. So um, what that means is now there is a special account for that. So if you have questions, if you have videos that you want to send in, if you have audio notes that you want to send in, message me through there. I'll play those videos. I'll, I'll play those audio notes here, and we'll tackle questions that way. So follow me on Instagram at the Drop Set Podcast. That's going to be the home for everything related to this show going forward. We'll do some excerpts. Um, um, and some behind the scenes stuff as well. So looking to get that going here. I've got a little bit of stuff up there already. Um, I'm always uh, a little wary of adding another social media account to manage, but I'm really trying to do something with this podcast now. So um, I, felt, I felt like it was time and it kind of separates it out from my own stuff, which will be still at Darren underscore star, which now there's going to be a lot more prep stuff. I was really kind of struggling, like how do I manage that with all the podcast stuff, which is what I've been posting on there lately more than anything else. So I'm going to separate the two. So that's the big news for the week. Um, also coming up, um, just a little self-promotional here. Um, my hypertrophy university course will be coming soon. Um, I'm kind of have that set tentatively for a June 1st release date. It might actually come sooner than that. This is basically a classroom course, 16 chapters long, everything that you want to know about building muscle, uh, how to do it, um, things that people do wrong, common mistakes, mindset approaches, practical approaches. Um, there's a deep dive on progressive overload. I do some case studies and some log breakdowns, all kinds of stuff. It's super in-depth. That will be a part of other courses that I put out in the future, including Bikini Blueprint, which I've talked about here. There is also going to be a Men's Physique Blueprint, um, and that Hypertrophy University will be an element of both of those courses as well. So you can check that all out at fivestardigital.com. That's F-I-V-E, star with two R's, digital.com. That site is now live and close enough to being ready for public consumption that I wouldn't be too embarrassed if anybody went there and checked it out. Now, to the episode at hand, shall we? That was a lot of rigmarole at the start. So this is episode 250, whatever it is, 252. Yeah, okay. So here we go. Um, inside the episode, we are going to have, oh my goodness, some listener questions. We got a voicemail here, and uh, I don't know what's in it. I know who it's from, and because uh, uh, the call in number, if we still want to do that, is 865 518 6569. You can always call in and leave your questions there, um, as spoiler alert, as Grace did here. So I get a transcript of that in my Google voicemail box. I don't read it. Like I read it enough to know that it was her. I didn't read the rest of it. So I don't know what's in it. So you're going to listen to it with me here for the first time in a little bit. Um, also, uh, before we get to that, I'm going to talk about a little bit about food fixation and cravings. This is something that's near and dear to my heart because it's something that I've struggled with for all of my bodybuilding career. And I feel like I finally kind of have a handle on it now. So I can't promise that what has worked for me is going to work for you. But what I can say is that um, you will get something from this and hopefully some tactics that you can learn if you deal with hunger cravings or you know food fixation and we're going to define all three of those and there are separate strategies for all of them and how we can uh, how we can treat those and make them less of a part of our lives going forward and 
the, the big topic for um, today is how do you know if you're ready to compete? And that's where we're going to start. So let's just dive into it here. How do you know if you're ready to compete? What does it really mean to be stage ready? So the first thing that we have to know is that every last bit of this is arbitrary. So uh, only one person gets to decide if you're ready and that's you or two people if you want to include your coach in that conversation. Ultimately, it doesn't really matter. Um, the key point that you have to ask yourself though is a very simple one. Why are you doing this? Um, what is your goal, both short term and long term? If you're, and I think I, I kind of fall into a slightly different category than a lot of coaches do here. Um, a lot of coaches are all about putting in your dues, putting in a couple years of worth of work in the gym, et cetera, to make a big splash in your first show. Well, my whole thing there is you're not going to make a big splash in your first show likely just because it's going to be so fucking weird. Like you're going to have, you're going to be a deer in the headlights, no matter how ready you are, just because it's such a weird experience getting up on stage for the first time. So I'm a big fan of ripping the bandaid off and doing that as early as possible. Um, that stage experience is super, super valuable. Um, there's just so much value in doing an early show. The stage experience is part of it. You get the experience of going through an entire prep. Um, you also establish a baseline for future shows. So you can say, okay, cool. And clearly I'm not saying like, oh, I signed up with my coach in four weeks, I'm going to do a show, but I'm saying like, you know, start the process and maybe spend eight to 10 months getting ready for that first show. You know, if you have the opportunity to get a little bit of a growth phase and then jump into a full length prep, that is what I would consider rushing it. Um, if somebody signs up with me and they're like, I want to do a show in eight weeks. I'm like, man, if you aren't already signed up for it, we're not doing that. <laughs> like it's a terrible idea. And so I have a lot of conversations with people just telling them up front, like, this is a bad idea. I'm not telling you, you can't do it because I'm not one of those coaches where it's like, you know, it's my name that's going up there too. I'm like, yeah, this is all you. You know, I mean, yeah, I'm coaching you and I'm helping you and whatever you accomplish, I'm going to be proud of you for doing it. But, you know, I don't have an ego in this process. I'm not looking out for myself in this. I'm looking out for you. So I don't care if somebody wants to get up on stage before they're necessarily ready in the eyes of the masses. I don't care as long as you know what you're getting into and why you're going about it and why you're doing it. So, um, so you establish that baseline of prep. Um, you get an opportunity to meet a lot of people. Um, and making connections in this is huge. You know, going back, uh, I think it was two episodes ago, I talked about, you know, what I would do differently in bodybuilding if I was starting over from scratch. And one of those things is I would meet more people and make more networking connections. So um, doing more shows is a great opportunity for, to do that. You also get the opportunity to make some mistakes, which is great because <laughs> uh, a, make, a mistake that you make now is a mistake that you can avoid making down the road, which is hugely valuable. Um, and the mantra that I always like to fall back on, not just with this, but with pretty much everything in life, is take imperfect action. What that means is you don't have to wait for everything to be perfect before you just decide you're going to fucking do something. Like, yes, you could spend five years building muscle and getting ready for your first show, but how much opportunity did you miss out on before doing that? This is something that comes up a lot in business. Oh, I'm going to start this business, but I need to do this first. I need to do this first. I need to do this first before I can take on a client. Just get a fucking client. That's it. Just put in the work and, you know, flounder for a little bit. Maybe you fail spectacularly. Maybe you're moderately successful, but you're learning something in the process either way. So, you know, there are no lives at stake here, right? So it's not like this is something that you need to be terrified of. Just do it. Just absolutely do it. The, going back, though, talking about why are you doing this? What's your goal? Um, if somebody had the goal of like, I want, and, and this is, a, it's a good thing to know. I don't know how much it really influences my recommendation on whether somebody do a show sooner or later. Because if their goal was like, well, I want to, I want to earn my pro card and I want to compete as a pro for a long time. Okay. We're going to have a talk about, you know, assessing your genetic potential. Um, we're going to look at your overall training age see how much of that potential you may already have realized, want to compete as a pro at what level? Like, are you looking to compete as an OCB or an NGA pro? Or are you looking to be an IFBB pro? Um, if it's the latter, what's your attitude towards PEDs? If it's a category that would benefit um, greatly from those. Um, and so there's a lot of conversation that you have to have there. But, you know, if your goal is to be a pro, then, I mean, I think the goal, I think my goal for you would be to, great, let's experience a full prep first. Because first of all, a lot of people come to me and they, they come to me with that goal of I want to be a pro when they've never even done a show. I'm like, you don't even know if you're going to like this. Like, why don't we start there? Let's go through the process. Because I've worked with a lot of people who go through prep, do a show, and they're like, yeah, I'm not doing that again. 
that it was too hard. I didn't like it. And no, no fault to them. It's like, you know, it's not for everybody. And so committing to a huge goal that you're going to invest years and years of your time into when you haven't even done it yet. It's kind of like saying, you know, I want to, I want to play a uh, guitar on stage with whoever, what, but you haven't even picked up the instrument yet. I'm like, well, why don't you take some lessons and play for a little bit and see if you even like it? Cause you might not. You might like the idea of it more than actually doing it. And the same thing applies to competing because the, the, what competing is, it's months and months and months and months of work for about three minutes on stage. So it's, it's, it really can be kind of anticlimactic. And for some people, it's worth it. And for some people, they're like, yeah, that was just too much work for that. I want to do that again. So I think there's value, especially if you have a really big goal like a really long-term goal that might take years to see out, do a show sooner simply because uh, you need to know if it's really what you want to do or not. You can't make the assumption. And you could say like, oh God, I love dieting. I love training. I love every aspect of that. And then you might get to show day. And like me, you're like, God, I fucking hate this. I hate show day. Show day sucks. I, like for me, I love the process of going through everything way more than the actual show. I'm kind of the opposite of most people. Most people kind of suffer through the process or they tolerate it or they're okay with it, but they don't really love it, but they love show day. They love the payoff of that. Um, and I'm kind of like the same thing with, you know, my, in my band, like I love practicing songs. I love getting together and doing rehearsal and stuff like that. Actual show day, get gig day, like stresses me out. Like I'm a ball of nerves. <laughs> I did this talent show at my wife's school last week, I guess. Um, you know, she's faculty there. So she, um, uh, they, they often will have a faculty member open the show. And so she wanted to sing one of our songs from the band and have me come on stage and accompany her. And so, and this was, uh, in front of a group of students that are pre-K through fifth grade. So let's be clear. It's a pretty friendly audience. You know, she's like everybody's favorite teacher. So like it's very low pressure, very low pressure. I still was like about ready to throw up backstage. Like I don't enjoy performing. I, I, I don't enjoy, I mean, once you get up there and you get comfortable, it's fine. But in that case, like you get one song. If you fuck it up, like you fucked it up, you don't get a chance to do it over. If you're playing a three hour gig and you fuck up a song, who cares? You got 45 more, you know? So uh, it's a little different. It's a little different, but I don't care for show day at all. All the waiting around just, you know, I just, I don't like it. I'll, I'll do it, but it's not what keeps me coming back. Uh, seeing through, um, the process to a completion point is what keeps me coming back. So, um, knowing why you want to do it, if, if it's going to be a one and done for somebody, it's the same kind of thinking. Like, well, if you're only, if you know, you just want to do this once, it's a bucket list item. You want to cross it off your list. I work with a lot of people who say that, um, then take your time and do it right. Like, don't rush it. So you could make an argument either way for either of those categories or anybody in between. Um, yeah, what, the, the most common goal for your first show, um, th this is not the one that I hear, but this is the one that I want to program into people's heads, is to look like you belong up there. That's the important thing. The, the most common goal that I actually hear is, I want to win. And it's like, yeah, it, your first show, you're not going to win it unless you're a freak right? Um, it just doesn't happen or unless it's a super uncompetitive show, but you can't go in there expecting to win your first show. It's pretty unrealistic. And so I will disabuse people of that very early on. And I get a lot of pushback from people. And a lot of people don't end up hiring me as a coach because I tell them like, you're probably not going to win your first show. Like, why would you say that? You're my coach. Like you're supposed to help me do that. I'm like, yeah, but I can't control who else is up there. And you know, you're in a, a group of people and they've all competed 10 times. And this is your first show. What on earth makes you think that you should win that show? Like that's delusional. And so I don't want to work with people who are delusional. <laughs> so like having some confidence is great. And if you could say like, I want to be in contention. Okay. That's a different statement. That's a, I can get behind that or saying, I want to look like I belong up there. Yes. Everybody should have that as their goal for sure. So you need to consider what organization you're competing in and the standards of that organization. So, um, you know, if you, uh, you might look to uh, a lot of, uh, pro bodybuilders out there and they're just huge and you're like, God, I can't hang with them, but you're a natural athlete. You're not going to compete in the NPC going into the IFBB. You're going to compete in the OCB or the INBA. You know, it's like, it's different playing field. So, um, you need to have a realistic assessment of where you stand. And to be clear, I, I could write a book on this lately, uh, you can't really evaluate yourself. That's where you need somebody else, a professional eye to help you out with. Um, you need to be realistic also about your genetics and about the time frame associated with this. Um, so it, typically, uh, most people are not genetic freaks. <laughs> let's, be, let's 
be clear on that. Um, and if you are, you're probably not looking around watching bodybuilding or listening to bodybuilding podcasts like this or reading into like, how can I build muscle? Like for you, it's easy because you're a genetic freak. And by the way, like screw you at the same time. So you suck. Um, so, you know, you got to know your place. Um, and also like there is some, uh, there's a lot of variability when it comes to the time frame as well. Um, like for me, like I'm very, it takes me forever to build muscle and as it does for most people, I can cut down pretty quickly, but the problem is I usually need to cut down a lot. So while I can cut down at a good rate, I still need a lot of time, um, to do it. So what's like my current prep is 22 weeks. I've been in it for 14 weeks. I still have eight to go. I've dropped a lot of weight. I still have a lot more to drop as well. So, um, you have to have, be very realistic about the time frame involved. And especially if there's a growth phase or possibly more, multiple growth phases are needed, like stretch out the clock a little bit for sure. Um, and you also get some experience, um, in cutting and growing, and then you can start to see some of what that potential is going to be. Um, when you get to, um, some more extreme levels, even if you don't see it through to a full show, but let's say you like, okay, I'm going to do a prep here and I'm going to try to get to like a six week out aesthetic, but then I need to spend more time growing. I don't want to get up on stage yet. That's totally fair. That's totally fair. We'd call that kind of a mini cut, maybe an extended mini cut, but nonetheless. Um, and then you can start to see like, okay, I can kind of see the potential here of what things might look like if I carry this through for another six weeks. And then you can make a decision at that point as well. Like, okay, well, uh, let's actually do it. Let's commit to it. Let's see it all the way through. Let's do it. Or you can say like, okay, this glimpse is enough. I know what I need to work on now. Let's focus on fixing it. Um, <clears throat> some additional points to consider here. Um, this is a visual game. You do not want to be chasing numbers unless it is to evaluate your rate of change. Or if you do have to hit a weight cap or, um, a, a target weight class as well. So for me, this prep has largely up until this point been a numbers game. I'm chasing 209. I'm very clearly going to hit that. So now I don't have to worry about that. Now it becomes a visual game. Like what weight do I need to be at in order to have the right look? So I'm still correlating it to a number just because the number is trackable. But at this point, I've been kind of like easing into it. I'm not trying to kill myself um, on anything with regards to my prep. Um, just trying to maintain a rate of loss that keeps me within striking distance of that target. Well, now I'm, I'm clearly like, I'm going to, I'm going to be able to shoot way past it. So now I can start to spend a little bit more time thinking how much do I have to cut down in order to really hit the target aesthetic that I want. Um, and it's going to be way less than 209. So I'm not going to come in at the cap. That's fine. I would I'd really want to, but it doesn't matter if I come in at 209, I'm going to be f the fattest guy on stage and we don't want that. So, <laughs> um, this often requires an outside perspective. And so the question of like, how do you know if you're stage ready? It's a very difficult question to answer yourself, but also, um, stage ready for whom and for what I always tell people, like, if you just heard what bodybuilding is today, um, today's Thursday and you found out that there's a local show on Saturday, um, you're, everybody is stage ready. Like you can pay the fee, probably a late fee as well and go and compete on Saturday if you wanted to. Now, you will not be competitive, more than likely. <laughs> There's always that genetic freak out there that can just walk off the street with no prep and you know still make a second call out. Like, how the fuck did that happen? Like, that shouldn't happen at all. Um, so, but you can do it. So, stage ready is. I'm I'm talking more about competitive stage ready. So, um, you need to evaluate it on two levels. There's a level of muscularity for the category that you want to compete in, um, and then there is a level of conditioning for the category that you want to compete in. So the level of muscularity is something that you can know well in advance. Like, do I have enough muscle for this? Um, you can kind of learn that in the off season, right? Just by, you know, you can, it still requires some imagination. You have to imagine yourself as a sculptor with a big hunk of marble and you're going to cut away all the stuff that isn't your stage ready physique and you know, what's left under that. So it does still require some imagination. Um, but what you can't know necessarily is, you know, can you achieve the level of conditioning and leanness that you have to? And this is something a lot of people chase over the course of many, many, many shows, like trying to get as lean as they need to be. Many people never really hit the mark, having done 15, 20 shows. A lot of people still never get there. They're like, yeah, I was close, but I still was not lean enough, as lean as I need to be in order to be competitive. So or competitive for, for the top spot in order to win that show. Uh, or like, yeah, I'm, I'm here, I'm at the Nationals, but I'm not lean enough to win. I've got the size, I just don't have the, the sharpness to pull it off. So that's one of those things that you can't predict necessarily beforehand. You can make some, some estimations, like if you're generally on the softer side, you're probably gonna have a hard time cutting down. If you walk around even in the off season and you've, you've got some abs hanging around, you're probably gonna have an easier time cutting down, but it's still, 
you know, easier time just means it's possible. You're going to have to work. Whereas somebody who is on the softer side, you're just going to have to absolutely brutalize yourself in order to get stage lean. And that's just genetics. There's nothing you can really do about that. So, hey, Taz, how you doing, buddy? Taz just walked in. He's checking on me. I'm okay. It's all good here, dude. Um, so the, the goggles of self-evaluation can be very, very cruel. And nobody knows that better than me right now. Like I'm struggling with that big time. My last prep vlog that I posted, um, <laughs> for, for nine weeks out was basically like, I think I might quit <laughs> just because I'm not happy with what I'm seeing at nine weeks out. I've kind of got that worked out of my system now. Um, but it's still not, not a guarantee that I'm going to do this show. So, um, some hard rules. <laughs> so, this is the things like this, this is less about the visual thing, but more about, um, you know, let, let's just talk about what it requires to be on stage. Um, if you can't follow a diet for three to four weeks without having some problems, you just aren't ready to be a competitive bodybuilder yet. Like you've got to get your act together and you've got to be able to follow a plan. Um, because that is a fraction of the time that you'll need to do that for during prep. So, um, toughen it up get some discipline. Maybe you have the wrong meal plan. Maybe you're eating the wrong foods. There's no magical foods for fat loss or muscle gain, but there's magical foods that make your plan easier to adhere to. And so make sure that you have a good plan set up that enables you for success. That's part of it as well. If you're eating tilapia and green beans six times a day and you can't follow that plan, I don't fucking blame you. I couldn't follow that plan either. That's a shitty plan. Don't, don't follow that plan. Get a better one. You can do better than that. Um, if you can't give up alcohol completely, you aren't ready. Like you, you prep is a dry activity. You can't take in alcohol and go through prep and be worried like, Oh, am I going to be stage ready? Like probably not. And if you quit drinking, it would help. So that, that's again, prerequisite. This shouldn't be hard rules so much as prerequisites. Um, if you routinely like on a weekly or every other week basis, miss a workout, um, you aren't ready. Um, it's the discipline where if, if it's on your calendar and if it's scheduled, um, you go period, that's it. Exceptions made for sickness and exceptions made for emergencies. But some people are like, my kid has a soccer game. That's an emergency. That's not an emergency. You planned poorly. So if you find yourself in that situation where it's like, oh, I was going to work out, but oh, this thing came up. You can't let shit come up during prep to, that pulls you away from prep activities. Um, it is a competition keep in mind. And part of that comp, every last bit of that competition happens before you get up on stage. That's just the presentation of what you've been working on the whole time. But what you've been working on the whole time is the competition. And so if you're missing stuff, if you're off on your diet, uh, you're just, you know, you're giving easy wins to other people that are going to be up on stage with you. So uh, whether you have genetic advantages or not, um, if you find yourself disliking the process, also you aren't ready. Um, if you're like, Oh, the diet, Oh my God, cardio, fuck me. Uh, well, guess what? Diet and cardio are what this is all about. And if you don't like those bodybuilding probably isn't for you, like find something else to do. <laughs> like there, there's plenty of things on this planet that you can do to occupy your time. And why would you pick a, a hobby? Cause let's be, let's be clear. That's what this is. Nobody's getting rich off this stuff. Um, why would you pick a hobby that is loaded up with stuff that you hate? It makes no sense. So don't do that. Don't do that. Um, like you should enjoy it. And to be clear, like that can be a process as well. I've never really struggled with the diet myself. There are times where I'm like, I don't want to do this, Ugh. but generally I'm fine with it. Like a standard bodybuilding diet. I can follow that. Okay. I can be fine with it. I've never really loved cardio. Um, I didn't hate it, but I didn't love it at this point though. Like you, you find ways to make it more appealing. Like I've, I've tweaked my meal plan and I've given up the whole clean eating um, side of things. Like, yes, I have plenty of meals that are clean. I have plenty that are not. I've talked about this a lot. So I'm definitely a, uh, a, an if it fits your macros kind of guy, I follow the same meal plan every day, but I just use macros to fill those meals up with stuff that's appealing to me. So after I finish recording this pro podcast, meal three is coming up, which is a deli Turkey sandwich with some mustard pickle slices, sliced red onion, romaine lettuce, and some pita chips. Like that's fucking good. Like I look forward to that every single day. Um, you know, my last meal of the day is my favorite because it's also my biggest. I do that on purpose. It's raw spinach, ground turkey, mustard again, staple, black beans, rice, avocado, and uh, like about uh, three quarters of a pound of salt as well thrown in there. Like that's some good shit. My wife is like, you, I mean, okay, I get it, but you really like it that much? I'm like, I do. And then she says, like, well, it's just because you haven't had real food in months, <laughs> which there may be something to that. But, you know, if I look forward to it, like, that's great. Like, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to both of those meals today. Um, meal one, I really look forward to that. Meal two, eh, 
it, it, it's a shake and some cereal post workout. I'm fine with that. It's okay. Whatever. Meal four is the only one that's disappointing, and so I'm changing that this week. It's just a protein shake. Like it's tasty, but it's just so unsatisfying just because it's just a protein shake. So I'm gonna swap that out for a chicken and veg meal here again. More salt that way. Um, same macros though. So, um, but the meal plan should be something that you like, and when it is, when it's loaded with stuff that you like the tendency to want to stray from that goes way down and it just becomes much easier to, to adhere to cardio. Similarly, if you, uh, set up your cardio to be an activity that you enjoy, great. So, you know, I'm listening to music or I'm watching YouTube videos, um, on there and it's all stuff that's relevant, um, to my interests. So, you know, I got to grind away on the elliptical. I'm pounding away. I'm doing it, but I'm like entertaining myself at the same time. And so that's my time to kind of like zone out have a little mindless entertainment. It's like TV time, but I just have to be on the elliptical and burning calories. So um, at that point, post work, I'm like, yeah, I kind of need this. Just kind of clear my brain a little bit before we leave the gym. All right, cool. And the rest of the cardio I do is all walking my dog. And Taz loves that, right, buddy? He's a little shy right now, but yes, he loves that. Um, so he gets two walks a day when I'm in prep now that the weather is is cooperative for that. And that's great as well. So you turn cardio into something you enjoy. Turn the meal plan into something you enjoy. And when you can find yourself adhering to the plan without really feeling like you're stretching yourself in order to do so, in order to do so, that is a magical, magical place to be. Quick time out here and thanks again for watching. So podcasting is fun for me, but coaching is how I actually make a living. <laughs> Being an online coach has been my exclusive full-time gig for coming up on 15 years now. Hard to believe that. If you're looking for a coach, either for competition prep or just to get in the best shape of your life, you can check out 5starphysique.com and click on coaching for details on the programs that I offer. Quick version here. I get a ton of information up front to create a starting plan, and then we check in weekly to adjust that as we go based on your specific goal and the timeline involved. There's loads of detail up on the website, so I'll keep this short. Just check out 5starphysique.com for details. The link is in the description below. I do take on a limited number of clients and want to have a little bit of back and forth before starting up just to make sure that we're a good fit. So check out the website, read up, and hit the contact button to reach out to me directly. Okay, back to it. And welcome back. I think those commercials are already stale. I need to update those things. Um, I also have new stuff that I'd rather put in those commercials. So project for this coming weekend, I guess. Lordy. Um, by the way, good luck to my client, Mitch, um, who is competing up in Maine this weekend at a show that we've been kind of working towards for a long time. Kind of excited to see how that works out. Um, he's doing classic physique. He is ready to rock. We've been, you know, carving him up this week. It's Thursday as of the time recording this. It'll be Friday by the time I post it. So by the time a lot of you listen to this, it'll be show day for him. Um, so really excited to see how uh, how he turns out. I mean, I know how he's going to turn down. It'll be excited to see how the show turns out, though. So um, just a quick reminder, at the Drop Set Podcast, on Instagram. I'm going to be beating you all over the head with that. I want to get some followers there um, and send me your stuff. So message me. I will be looking for message requests from people that I do not follow back on that. I'll be looking for your message requests and uh, send some videos, send some audio notes, and I'll figure out a way to get those off my phone and we'll play those on here and open up the Q&A that way for people who don't want to like call a phone number, God forbid. I know it's, it's kind of like uh, it, it's a terrible thing, right? Talking on the phone. Let's talk. Um, let's talk food fixation and cravings here. Appetite will be a small part of this conversation as well. So when I say food fixation, what do I mean? Well, we'll get to that here. Um, let's differentiate first thing, just a top level definition, appetite and cravings. So hunger, your appetite, that is a physical thing. And that is also like, you know, if you're hungry, you will eat anything that's put in front of you. Um, cravings are just a brain thing for something specific. Example, oh God, I'm so hungry. Here, have a carrot. Oh no, thanks, that's okay. That's a craving for something unspecified. You just don't know what or you're not saying what. That isn't being hungry. That's being picky about what you want. If you're really hungry, you will fucking lick ice cubes and love it. Doesn't matter. So um, be realistic about what it is. Differentiate. Hunger is a very physical thing. Your stomach needs more stuff in it. Cravings come from the brain. I want this. And sometimes it can be kind of a general craving. Like, I want something salty. I want something sweet. I want that donut right now. I want that bag of Oreos that's sitting on the cabinet up there right now. Yes, I'm actually pointing to it right now. I, I could see it, but that light's blocking it out. But I know it's up there. I know it's up there. It's been haunting me for months. And, uh... I would say they're stale by now, but they probably aren't. Those things keep forever, right? Oh, Lordy. 
<laughs> so um, appetite, we can manage that to an extent. And this is where things start to differentiate a little bit because a craving comes from your brain. You can't necessarily manage that with traditional tactics. So um, what are some things that we can do to manage your appetite? Well, high volume, high fiber foods. So, um, you know, the, one of the things that I tell people if they start to report like legit hunger, like I'm waking up in the middle of the night hungry. Okay, well, it's not that you need to eat more before you go to bed necessarily that can help but also if you just fill yourself up more earlier in the day you'll be more satiated when you get to later meals those later meals will fill you up more as well so um typically like slow gi emptying foods that's where the high fiber comes from um avoiding liquid meals so shakes become a bad idea when your appetite really ramps up um and replace it with solid food protein sources high volume carbs um high volume and high fiber are usually conflated but like rice cakes are a high volume carb source you know if you look at 50 grams of carbs from rice versus 50 grams of carbs from rice cakes and just put those side by side, which one's bigger? Well, the bigger one's going to sit in your gut a little bit longer, right? It takes you more time to process that. It's more to eat. The act of eating is, uh, is um, satiating in and of itself. So you can always just eat slower, take your time with it. Um, that's helpful. And so if it's higher volume, you kind of have to take your time with it. Um, consider more or fewer meals. If you're eating four meals a day, I wouldn't go to three, but you could try five. If you're at five or six, try four or five, you know, try and decrease because if you do that, your meals can be larger. That might be the answer. Um, I have really kind of settled in on five meals per day as being the sweet spot for me more than that. And I have to stop too many times to eat less than that. And my gaps between meals are too long. So five is really kind of the sweet spot for me. Figure out where your sweet spot is. Um, consider carb or calorie cycling to match your output levels. It's a very common prep tactic. You know, on your higher output days, you have higher carbs. On your lower output days, you have lower carbs. And you could break it up further and do a three-phase carb cycle where you have low, medium, and high days. That's what I'm doing right now. My leg days, high intake. Other training days, lower intake. Rest days, lowest intake. Um, so you don't want to encourage yourself to be really lazy on the low days, but nothing requires carbs, energy, and drives fatigue quite like training. And so on your non-training days, you can get away with fewer carbs. Absolutely. So that is just a common tactic to use. And sometimes you just have to suck it up. Like sometimes it's just ass and balls and you just got to suck it up. So learn to deal with it. That's it. That is sometimes the answer. Once you've done all the other things, if you're still there, it's like, okay, here's the solution. So um, cravings, aka the brain wants what it wants. Yes, it does. And oftentimes there isn't a lot of rhyme or reason as to why. So these suck, um, but there is kind of an easy solution. It just happens to be hard to execute. Um, and the solution is think about something else. That's it. Like, it keep, keep yourself busy. Cravings most commonly come, what I have found in my own personal experience, they come about during idle time um, because a busy brain just doesn't have time to be thinking about stuff that you want to eat. Um, and so what I have learned, and I, I tried the opposite of this in 2021 when I did my last show, um, was I cleared my schedule and did a whole bunch of like big picture items and knocked those things out before prep started so I could just have a more easy time of it. Um, it's not like I, I deliberately reduced my client load or anything like that, but I had big projects and I got all those knocked out before starting prep just so I had less to worry about. I could have a little bit more idle time and it sucked. It, that was not the right idea. So this time around, I am loading myself up on business stuff. So it's not stuff that is physically exhausting me, but it's stuff that's keeping me busy and keeping my hands busy on the keyboard with work stuff. So I'm building these courses. I'm launching a new um, subset of my business, this five-star digital creation, which is where all the courses will sit. Um, I'm coming up with uh, some some freebie giveaway things um, to uh, to help build a mailing list. Um, I'm stepping up my production efforts on the podcast. As you can see here, I'm stepping up production efforts on my YouTube channel overall. Um, there's a lot that I'm doing here and it's keeping me super busy. I have long days. It's not physically exhausting. It's mentally exhausting for sure. But also I find myself like, oh shit, I got to eat. Oh God, I'm hungry. Fuck. Like it, it, you'd rather be in that position than like it's 11 o'clock. I'm just sitting here. I got three hours until I can eat again. Hmm. Fuck my life. Why am I doing this? Bodybuilding sucks. Like, keep yourself busy. Keep yourself busy. Um, that It's so, so hugely impactful for having a successful prep. Um, I stay as busy as I possibly can without really overdoing it for this very reason. Um, and how do I know when I overdo it? 
Well, unfortunately, it's like popping a balloon. You only know once it happens and then it's too late. <laughs> so the good thing is um, the stuff that I am all adding onto my plate, I'm just creating more commitments for myself that I can easily just scale back on if I need to. So if I find like I can't get all this shit done, well, my earliest, my, my top priority every day is, um, is responding to client check-ins. That's, that's when, you know, I'm up at four 30, I do my cardio, I clean out my inbox. I'm on that immediately for an hour to an hour and a half. Um, I take a break, I go to the gym, I come back and try to finish up as much of that stuff as I can. And I save a little bit for around seven o'clock just in case there's any stragglers who are late, which there always are. Um, so like, that's the top priority for me. All the other stuff has to happen in the middle. Um, and so the other stuff, if something you know gets delayed or doesn't happen, it's like, that's okay. We can push it off to the next day. I don't want to do that just because I am really like particular about keeping up with my calendar, but I'm loading myself up with things that I feel I can do, or if I don't, it's okay to push them back for a day. So the stuff that I'm, um, that other people are relying on me to do, to do those are top priority. And th those are like my one a level tasks. Everything else is two a level at best. So, um, some extra strategies that you can use here. So uh, commercial free television. Um, so streaming services, um, Amazon now makes you pay extra for commercial free prime TV, which sucks. Um, YouTube premium is great. I don't get ads on YouTube. I watch more YouTube than anything else these days. YouTube premium is like $11 a month. Totally worth it to never see an ad on a YouTube video. It's awesome. The reason why I say commercial free TV is because You've got these ads for pizzas, burgers, cookies, donuts, bullshit that come up. That's the last thing I need to see during prep. Like, I feel like I'm pretty focused, but if I bombard myself with enough of that shit, it's going to start to worm its way into my head. And so I just don't let it in there to begin with. Um, similarly, like I'm not watching Food Network or anything like that. It's like it's a terrible idea. So, and a lot of people, they like browse food, Pinterest things during prep just so that they can at least look at the stuff they can't eat. I mean, I get that some people make that work. I just think it's a terrible idea. And I think if you don't know, you're playing with fire. Um, limit your social media exposure. Um, so you will see a lot of shit that you can't have there. Um, also like if you're in prep, the comparison game always comes up like, Oh, I don't look like that person. Oh shit. You know, so, you know, social media does more negative for us than positive. And I think more and more people are coming around to that, um, that, uh, realization here. So, Follow at the Drop Set Podcast on Instagram and send me your notes and uh, messages and videos, please. Um, I mean, it can be a good thing, um, but this utopic vision of it is like it's bringing everybody together. It kind of divides us more than anything else. So I'm I'm generally not a fan. I use it for business stuff. I'm really not on it much outside of that. Communicate with people here and there. That's about it. I try to consume and scroll as little as I can, realistically. So. Um, you still want to focus on high volume foods um, just because even though that's more of an appetite strategy, if your brain is constantly like, you know, it's spending more time and your stomach is spending more time processing food, um, that gives less of a reason for your brain to really get involved in the game when we don't want it involved in this game at all. We want it to shut up and sit on the sidelines. Some, uh, some additional strategies, some other things that we can do here. Enjoy your food. We talked about this before. Your meal plan should be something that you enjoy. If it's not, you got to change it eat slower. We talked about that as well. Use a smaller plate or a bowl, smaller utensils, because it makes your food look bigger. And that visual thing is a big deal. Um, I don't think this made it onto the list. I wrote it a couple days ago, but one thing that just came to mind is, um, prepare multi-course meals. So, um, you know, I, for my last meal I have, I, I mentioned it was uh, spinach, ground turkey, black beans, rice, avocado. Um, also on there is a piece of toast. Um, so I could have just added more rice and black beans and gotten the same macros. But if I add a piece of toast, that's a separate thing entirely. I take all the other stuff and I mix it all together. The piece of toast just kind of sits on top of there and like, Oh, I have a second course here. Awesome. Which I have it as the first course, obviously, because it's bread and you always want to eat that first. Um, but if you can set yourself up where like, that's one of the reasons that protein shake is really unsatisfying, not only because it's liquid, but just it's one thing. Ugh. You know, at least post-workout, I have my shake and I have a bowl with my cereal in it. Okay, that's something. That's good. Um, you know, uh, uh, my meal three, um, I have, except on non-training days, I have the sandwich and then a thing of pita crackers. It's two things. It's like, oh, I finished this. I still have this. It's a mental thing. You know, I, I like setting myself up with multi-course meals. You know, meal one is Greek yogurt and oats separately, separate bowls. Um, just because, hey, 
two courses. I'm telling you, it's, it's a powerful thing. It really is. Um, be engaged and mindful as you eat. Don't eat mindlessly. Um, like I'm really terrible about just watching TV as I eat, which is kind of mindless, but I've been trying to engage more on keeping that slower and making sure that I enjoy it as I go through the process. Because if you take the time to really like enjoy your food as you're eating it, not just having stuff that you enjoy, but being mindful and enjoying it as you go through it, it makes it last longer. It feels more substantial that way too. Um, and make sure that shit tastes good. Like whatever it takes, condiments, seasoning, salt, you know, if you have to track macros on certain things, just do that, but make it tasty, make it very, very appealing. Um, one thing that I do, I mentioned my meal five is my largest meal of the day. So I, I like to set up one larger meal, assuming you have the ability to do it. And uh, in doing so, uh, you can kind of, you know, it, it can be like, I call it my satiation point for the day. So one time during the day where I eat enough, I'm like, oh, I'm actually kind of full just because I have that set up. Whereas I could take some of those macros and spread them out into earlier meals. Um, and it might be useful that way. But then I never really have a meal that's big enough to where I feel full. And I think just that one daily point where you're like, oh, all right, finally, shut up, stomach. You're happy now. Having that is is a big, big freaking deal for sure. Um, and uh, it's also kind of a reward for making it through the day. <laughs> so I like it for that reason too. Um, food fixation, if we talk about that, is a craving that simply will not go away. It's like that earworm, that song that gets stuck in your head. But what happens to that song that gets stuck in your head? It goes away eventually, right? It's in there. It's in there. It's in there. Your brain's doing stupid shit. Why do I have total eclipse of the heart in my head for four fucking days now? And then day five, you wake up and it's gone. Food fixation is kind of like that as well. Um, it is there for a reason. So this is common at the tail end of prep just because you've had a lot of weeks where you just can't have the thing that you really want. And post-show where you can have it, but it's not enough. Because you need to, you know, you you need to reverse adaptations of prep. Your ghrelin is out of control. It's your um, it's your uh, appetite hormone. So, um, it just that just requires time, realistically. So it, this also can correlate to appetite. Like you're going to be more food fixated the hungrier you are, almost for certain. Um, <clears throat> some the same strategies for cravings apply. Keep yourself busy. It's it is just a longer wave that you have to ride out. So, which isn't fun. Um, and I wish there was a better answer for this, but there is not. And I always just say, remember that you've got a goal. You know, uh, whether it's a uh, uh, a show or a photo shoot or whatever, whatever that goal is, just remember that, and then have some kind of a reminder. So this can be something visual. It can be something tactile or something like that, um, that you can rely on and go back to. So I use this tactic, not for food fixation, but for something else. Um, I have like pretty crippling social anxiety in, in group settings, like go to a party, fuck my life. There is no worse scenario I can envision than that. A whole bunch of people that I probably don't know. Oh my God. So what I do is I keep something in my pocket that takes me back to a comfortable spot. And so that thing is, any guesses? It's G-rated, I promise. So having said that, any guesses? It's a guitar pick. Um, because when I'm sitting in my chair and noodling through some guitar parts, that is a very comfortable place for me to be. I am certainly not a great guitarist by any stretch of the imagination, but that takes me into a place where my brain is happy and I'm cool and I'm chill. And so I've got that in my pocket and just, you know, having that tactile thing in there takes me back to a place of comfort. And then suddenly the anxiety is, it doesn't go away, but it's easier to deal with. It lessens it a little bit. So having some kind of a tactile reminder of what your goal is it can be anything, you know, just be creative with what that is. Um, as a reminder, like, okay, yeah, that's why I'm doing this. It's not just like, you know, for some people it's like putting something on the lock screen of their phone. That's good as well. Um, you know, everybody responds to things differently. So whether it's a mantra that you repeat, it's something that you look at, it's something that you can actually touch in your hands, having something like that can really help to kind of reset your brain and pull it out of that mode when it's just stuck in this infinite feedback loop. Hey everybody, I hope you're enjoying this episode. Just wanted to take a quick time out to tell you about a promotion I have going on now for my workout programs at fivestarphysique.com. I have around 50 uh, programs available as of right now. These are comprehensive workout splits for all people, goals, and phases. You can search by volume, general difficulty level, even the number of supersets involved so you don't end up with something that you can't properly execute because your gym is just too damn busy when you go to train. 
All of these programs do include full video demonstration playlists for each day narrated by yours truly, so you know exactly what to focus on and what to watch out for on every move. These are ideal for all skill levels. You can use the promo code DROPSET, one word, at checkout to save 10 bucks on your first program. Link is in the description below or check out 5starphysique.com and click on workout programs. Okay, let's get back to it. Okay, y'all, you ready for this? Remember, um, at the Dropset Podcast on Instagram. Follow me, yeah. Let's do this. So we have a voicemail here. Um, I have not heard it yet. Um, I have it up on the screen over here. It's ready to play. I'm not gonna show you just cause, well, if I do, here, it looks like this. It's my media player. Not very exciting, right? So um, here's what I, I have. I think um, I, I just had it playing. I don't have my headphones on, so I couldn't hear it. But it looked like it was registering the audio, so I think it's all good here. And if it's not, for some reason, I will just drop it in in post-production. We're going to do it that way. So um, I know this is Grace. Thank you, Grace, for calling. And we're going to check it out and see what we got. So hold on. Uh, here we go. I have my uh, – incorrect. I have my laptop here. I might need to take some notes just because oftentimes Grace likes to hit me with more than one question at a time. And I need to take some notes to make sure that I don't forget shit. So um, all right, Grace. Take it away. Let's see what you got. Questions for you today. Oh, so God. I'm Hold on. Back it up. Hey, there Coach. It's Grace here. I have a few questions for you today, so I'm just going to jump right in. Please. My first question is, how do you address physique imbalances in your programming? How do you manipulate a client's nutrition and workout split to address any dominances or weaknesses in their physique? My second question is, at what point does someone need to worry about atrophy or loss of progress? For example, I have only been training legs once a week due to recovering from an injury. Since I started bodybuilding, I have never trained them fewer than two or even three times a week. Will this reduction in volume cause me to lose progress? And if, and if not, at what point do I need to be concerned about losing progress? My last question is not bodybuilding related, but I thought it would be thank, fun anyway. Thank God. What are some of your favorite guitar riffs of all time? <laughs> okay, that's everything for me today. Thank you so much, and I look forward to the next episode. That's hilarious. I feel like she snuck that last one in there just as a uh, as like a placation question for me. So um, I will resist the urge to tackle that one first, although I desperately want to. So um, what do we got? What do we got here? So um, – how do we address physique imbalances? So um, she didn't say, um, how do you address physique imbalances in prep? To which I would say you don't. Um, clearly that's an off season task. So um, it, the, the first thing is, and, and I would say, um, this might be a visual thing here. I'm gonna feel like such a douchebag for doing this. I, I've never done this on YouTube before. For those listening on the audio only version, great. Keep it that way, please. Let me center myself here on the screen. Don't get trampled, buddy. So um, I have uh, a pretty significant imbalance between my left and right bicep. The question is, if I flex like a douchebag here, can you tell? The lighting isn't super even. Right? To me, to my eye, I can't tell. And therefore, I don't worry about it. Now, it's a three quarters of an inch difference. That's pretty substantial. I can't tell. I can't tell. Now, I do have clients also who have had like, you know, knee surgery or something like that. And one leg is clearly uh, not as developed as the other one. That's a little bit more of a challenge because fixing something like that where it is a noticeable imbalance is really hard. And it requires a lot of impatience, a lot of patience. <laughs> does not require impatience that would be easy if that were the case um yeah it's 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 so hard so i mean it, it takes a lot of isolateral exercises a lot of overtraining the underdeveloped side um and trying to bring it up um to match the more properly appropriately developed side Bi bilateral exercises work too you just need to be mindful of the likelihood that your dominant side is going to want to take over and therefore it is going to get stronger still and still outpace the weaker side so um it's very, very tricky if it's something noticeable like that. If it's not noticeable, because um, I've, I've had people, you know, come to me with situations like that. My, my arm is a half inch bigger than the other one. All right, show me. 
And honestly, if I can't see it, my answer is don't fucking worry about it. Just because fixing it is such a giant pain in the ass. And there might come to be a point like in your competitive career where that becomes a, a detriment to you on stage. It's not going to be in your first couple of shows, more than likely. Um, and again, you need to be you need to keep a watchful eye on it. But it's unlikely that anybody's going to be like, oh, you know, you would have been first, except you know your your left dealt. It can be you know that's it, not matched up to your right. Oftentimes, this stuff can be corrected with posing as well. Oftentimes. <laughs> actually imbalances like that are because of posing. And if you just fix it and show yourself correctly, then the problem is solved. So, um, I know grace is also working through an engagement imbalance right now, um, between left and right, specifically when it comes to lats, like lats are just tricky for her to engage on. I don't remember which side, but one of them. Um, and so, uh, that is a tricky one because how do we address that? Like she's doing all the right things where, you know, you focus on a lot of isolateral exercises one side at a time, focus on really slowing the tempo down. Um, one thing that I've asked her to do is like, think about what specifically, like, is there a specific part of the range of motion where your good side feels more engaged and why? Because sometimes it's a mechanical thing that you're doing and it's a really subtle thing to watch. Like, you know, if you're doing a row on one side, your elbow wings out a little bit and on the other side, it doesn't. Like, it's hard to catch that kind of stuff. But there can be just a difference in something, maybe because of some old previous injury that happened when you were four that you don't even remember, but now your left side and your right side don't act exactly the same. And so therefore, one side has a more difficult time engaging than the other one. Um, that is a very tricky thing. Um, as far as fixing imbalances like aesthetic imbalances it really falls into you know is it something that's significant enough that we need to fix it and if not great let's just ignore it um as far as <laughs> that feels like a lazy answer but at the same time it's like there's so much other shit to do it's like at what at what point does it become a big enough priority that we need to focus on it and at what point are they like you know what there's so much more shit that we need to do we just need everything to grow i'm not worried about this imbalance let's just make everything bigger right now and just focus on making sure that we're not making the problem worse by having an imbalanced um, execution on bilateral exercises um at what point do you worry about atrophy or loss of progress? So um, keep in mind, like your minimum effective volume to maintain tissue is like eight sets per week. So if you're doing one leg day, uh, your legs, I mean, they might grow still not as well as if you're training them two or with a really good three session split that's designed with recovery in mind as well. Um, but with one leg day a week, you're absolutely maintaining tissue. You know, um, if you're training legs four sets per week, that's when you're like, yeah, you're probably you're probably dropping some a little bit for sure. Um, it also depends with legs. Like, okay, well, are you working them really hard outside of training? Like, are you doing a lot of running? Because running is not hypertrophic for legs. Um, are you operating at a caloric deficit? Are you sick? Um, you know, are you burning through a fever? Fevers will burn through tissue. Um, if you're under eating, like that's a perfect recipe for atrophy along with not training. But also like it takes time. It takes time on the order of many, many weeks. Um, it's not something where, oh, I don't train this for two weeks. It's going to atrophy. No, it's a slower process than that. Just like building muscle is a slower process as well. Your gains are not as, as um, fragile as you might think that they are. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about it. I mean, Grace, in your specific issue, I really wouldn't worry about it. Um, and also I know like the, the injury has been hip related and that's feeling better now. So we're progressing back into two leg days a week. So, um, it helps to have inside information for, for answering some of these questions. So, uh, that's a good one though. And I've worked with other clients who, you know, have to miss time due to injury or whatever. It's always a big concern. The thing is like, and we talked about this in the sickness chat last week, you have to differentiate between glycogen depletion and feeling flat and atrophy because they feel like the same thing, uh, but they're very different because one of them is very temporary. And as soon as you get back in the gym and you feed yourself like, oh, there it is. With atrophy, you ha it takes time to build it back up, although muscle memory is a thing and can help get you back to where you want to be. Um, as far as favorite guitar riffs, okay. How, I don't know how how far we are into the episode here, but I figure there's probably another 25 minutes left from here. So uh, let's go. Um, I would start with anything by Tool, first of all. Adam Jones is a riff monster. And the thing is, like, every Tool song is in drop D. It, like, it's all in the same tuning. It's all in the same key. And yet, he just continues to amaze. It's crazy. Um, Mark Tremonti is a great riff monster as well of Alter Bridge, formerly of Creed, 
also the guitarist for Creed. Uh, I'm not a big fan of Creed. Alter Bridge I love. And it's the same band, just with a different singer. It's amazing what a difference a lack of Scott Stapp will do for a band. Uh, I, I think he's great as well. Miles Kennedy, the other singer in that band, is, is also a great guitarist by his own right. Tremonti, I think, is usually the writer when it comes to the riffs. He's got some great ones. Um, I mean, Eddie, you know, come on. Eddie Van Halen, a, a massively underrated rhythm guitarist and riff writer as well. Jimmy Page, pretty much anything that Jimmy Page has ever done is amazing as far as riffs. If you're looking for specific examples, though, like, I mean, I'm picking all the low-hanging fruit here, right? I'm not going too deep into this. Um, John Petrucci is a great riff master of Dream Theater. Um, something like... Uh, <laughs> uh, the Dream Theater song "As I Am" has got like the, one of the heaviest opening riffs of all time. Got Dimebag Daryl, "Hello." I mean, uh, there there is no song on earth that's going to make me flip out and lose my shit completely like "Cowboys from Hell" by Pantera. Um, like that that is the song. It's like I'm clearly I'm not a headbanger. But that is the one song that makes me wish that I would grow out my hair long just so I could absolutely thrash around and give myself a concussion and fucking kill myself in a mosh pit. Like, if I had the opportunity to do that with the revived version of Pantera that's that's hanging around now with Charlie Benante and Zach Wilde um, and Rex and Phil, like, uh, Cowboys from Hell, I would lose my shit. I would not be able to contain myself. Um, that would be quite a sight, right? <laughs> Because I'm I'm usually pretty reserved and chill. What else? Um, I know I can edit out dead space here, but I'd rather not. I'd rather make it easier for myself in the editing booth. Um, are there any other major? I mean, the, as soon as I as soon as I stop this, I'm gonna think of a billion other um, guitarists. I'm like, oh, how did I not mention you know, blah Joe Satriani, for example? Um, oh. And there's a whole bunch of one-offs out there as well. Um, like there, there's there's some of those songs that you know a band might not have a whole bunch of like great riffs, but they've got one, and none of those are coming to mind right now. I'm gonna have to follow up. Like this is gonna have to be a follow-up impact segment after I have a chance to do some research. So that's my commitment to you, because Grace, that's an awesome question. These are the kind of hard quitting, hard hitting questions that I want here on the drop set. So. Um, so we're going to, we're going to wrap it up there. I don't know how long this episode is. This segment has been 12 minutes and 16 seconds by the looks of it. So, um, Grace, I thank you for contributing to that. Other people, um, at the drop set podcast on Instagram, shoot me a DM over there. I will look in the requests. Um, hit me up with a question, hit me up with a video, hit me up with a voice message. If you want to all that stuff, I'll play it on here. We'll talk about it going forward. Other than that, I just thank you all for listening. Seriously, like, if you made it to this point in the episode, it's fair for me to say, like, you're my favorite people. Thank you, because you just listened to the whole thing, and that is uncommon, uncommon. Special request also, I've mentioned this before about um, reviews, um, leave ratings online. My iTunes account, my Apple Podcasts account for the drop set, looks like it got reset due to a a configuration error that I think was my mistake. So now it looks like it has one review and that's it, which is a catastrophe um, as far as trying to grow the show. So um, if you're listening to this, please, please, please go and leave a review on Apple podcasts. If you listen there, it will help me out tremendously. I would really, really love that. So I'm not ready to yet pay for people to leave those reviews. Um, <laughs> but if you wait another couple of weeks, I might No, probably not. But anyway, thank you all for listening. I appreciate it. We'll peace out for right now. We'll be back for 253 next week. Okay, that wraps up another episode. And thank you all so much for watching. If you like this episode, please share it on social media and tag me on Instagram. I am at Darren underscore star. Also, please subscribe to the channel here if you haven't already. And feel free to check out any of those other videos that you see here as well. FiveStarPhysique.com has details on everything that I have to offer, including contest prep coaching, body transformation coaching, workout programs, swag, and a whole lot more. Thanks again for listening. And I will catch you all back here next week.